Hello and welcome to AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick, talking today with Professor Johnny Roger from the Glasgow School of Art about his new book, Key Essays, Mapping the Contemporary in Literature and Culture, published last year by Routledge. We talk about, well, the essay, its identity as a distinct literary form, its function as a critical practice and academic activity, about performativity and the capacity of language to affect change in the world, and the idea of the contemporary. Because of academia, there's the intersectionality and there's the interdisciplinarity. And for anybody uh, working in the arts and humanities at the moment, there are a broad range of topics or issues which everyone has to keep up with because we are changing our conception of the world. In this new globalised world, in this world of the internet, in this world of change, we are changing our conception of the world and how we live in it. And so, for example, there's certain topics you have to keep up with, like racism, sexism, feminism, the Anthropocene, decolonialism and and neocolonialism, and so forth. Now, clearly these are a a set of different uh, disciplines, if you like, but there there must be, everybody in every discipline must know about these things, must keep up to date with them. A's for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. I'm here today with Professor Johnny Roger of the Glasgow School of Art. Johnny, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Hi. Well, I I think you've kind of said it. There's not much more to say. I'm Johnny Roger of the Glasgow School of Art. I uh, I guess my title is Professor of Urban Literature. I'm often asked what that means. Uh, I think it just means any kind of... Sorry, I've dropped a thing here. Uh, Any kind of writing literature that engages with the urban with architecture with space and 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 that goes whether it's analytical architect uh, analytical writing sorry or or literary writing uh any kind of writing whatsoever okay um i think the best response to that though was from my daughter who once she was in my company when somebody said to me what is urban literature johnny and she says it's an urban myth Which I think should be the response I should give instead. What would be anyway. the, what would be the go-to text if you were to, I don't know, if you were to pick out uh, an exemplary example of urban literature? What would? I mean, that's a ridiculous question in a way, but is there some? I mean, because it because it comprehends so many different forms. You could look at something like say. In the book is Rem Cool has uh, junk space or anything by Rem Cool has you know, uh, yeah. you know small medium large extra large his books like that. You could look at Joyce's um, Ulysses for example. You could look at Alistair Gray's um, Lanark for example. You could look at uh, oh um, I'm forgetting people's names now of course, but you could look at all sorts of. Uh, Philosophers understand people like Heidegger, for example, talking about the bridge and, and uh, um, all his stuff about space and the building and things like that. You could look at especially people like Walter Benjamin. You could look at the philosopher, 1950s American philosopher, Suzanne Langer. I've found some really interesting stuff talking about space and about the margins and the mainstream space. Uh, in the American writer, contemporary writer, Anat Singh. So all sorts of different things, I think, uh, uh, have an engagement with uh, an understanding of space and how we operate in space, how we live in space, what we do. But it's, uh, we'll get onto this in a bit, I think. Um, But I like this idea of literature as a specific aspect of the architectural and um, I think we could talk about that a bit more the idea of the architect of architecture as a written phenomenon as well as a as well as a built aesthetic phenomenon um but but we are talking and I am I did want to talk to you firstly because you're a great human being but secondly because you've got this new book critical essays um uh published by Routledge this year 2021 isn't it yeah um and I, th- yeah, I, I think it would be great if you could start off by telling us a bit about that book, um, what it is, what it's about, where it comes from, and um, yeah. Okay, so thanks. Yeah, so the book is key essays. Uh, subtitle is uh, 
mapping the contemporary in literature and culture, it wasn't actually a subject I chose, but I wanted something similar, but we'll come back to that, I think, later on. But key essays is the key point. Now, why is it called key essays? I think it's, uh, it's really a study of how the essay as a form is becoming, this is my thesis anyway, ever more important and significant. What is that in the arts and humanities especially? Why is that? Uh, but first of all, to deal with the title, because the title is a specific reference, key essays, to the book um, Key Words by the great scholar Raymond Williams. Um, who, I'm, I'm not sure when he died, but he must have died at least 20, 30 years ago. He brought out a book, Key, key Words. Uh, I should say it's the centenary of Raymond Williams this year. So that's why specifically I wanted to make that reference and why I wanted to bring out this book this year. He uh, brought out a book in the early 70s called Key Words. And basically, uh, it was massively influential. You know, every undergraduate had it in their back pocket, as it were, in the arts and humanities. And it was uh, it was an attempt to substantiate universals, which were particularly important for um, certain social, political, cultural discussions at the time. So, for example, the word bourgeois. What does it mean? How do we use it? What's its history? And there's several pages on bourgeois. So it's the key words for discourse at that time, the masses. So you can see it's a very British Marxist text from the early 70s. Um, so basically, I wanted in some way to do for the post for the post Foucault age or the post Derrida age, if you like, uh, for, for the enunciation, what um, Raymond Williams did for the word. What I mean by that is that um, I don't think it's sustainable in, in our, our current day culture, in the contemporary, we'll come to that later, um, <clears throat> to be taking individual words on their own. So we should be looking at enunciation instead, because now we understand the relationship of words in the post Foucault and Derrida age. Um, also, I would say that rather than in the post humanist age in which we are, uh, rather than um, substantiate universals, which would be to impose actually uh, European concepts as universals around the world. In this globalized age, I don't think that's sustainable anymore. So we should be problematizing uh, universals rather than substantiating them, if you see what I mean. So, um, and anyway, we're in a different era. And I think it's much more appropriate to be analysing at the level of enunciation rather than at the level of the word. Um, and I think the essay also, I would say that I think the essay, why do I say that it's becoming ever more um, important and significant? I would say that uh, there are several ways of looking at this, understanding this. There are the more kind of pragmatic ways of looking at it and saying, well, look, in this era of quick change where culture moves on swiftly because of things like the internet, then the, the essay is a versatile tool uh, because obviously it can be written quickly. It's a short form. It can be published quickly. So as things change, so we can keep up with them, if you like. Uh, also, I guess on the supply side, uh, if you want to look at it that way, of the essay. Uh, of course, there has been much encouragement for the writing of essays in terms of the instigation of research exercises across many countries over the past 30, 40 years. These research exercises like the REF in, in current REF in, in the UK means that um, academics are encouraged to keep on publishing. Uh, to publish regularly to show that they are up to date with their discipline. So they're encouraged to write essays and there has been a proliferation of refereed journals which publish those essays. So there's a whole new culture of the essay uh, come, around, come about in the past 20, 30 years as well. So from that point of view, we can see that the, you know, the essay is proliferating, there's a culture of it which is thriving, but on the other hand, I guess you, in looking at supply side, if you like, um, then you're really saying, okay, so is it just for expediency then? And that would ignore what I would concentrate on in this book, 
which I believe to be the conceptual strengths of the essay. So it's not just about there's an opportunity because of the ref, because of this, you know, quick um, change around in culture that we have with the internet and so forth, uh, easy to publish and so forth. But I think there is also there are also specific conceptual strengths that the essay has for our age. Again, what do I mean by that? I'll come back to this, but you know, the essay is of uh, is a, a form which has uh, limited extent by definition. It's a short form, okay. Uh, so, um, and in as much as a short form, it has set limits, it has set borders, set edges, set limits. Uh, and as uh, Adorno actually said, he said its totality is something which is not total. So while it, it claims to have this completeness, it of course understands and lives with multiplicity because it's, it's not trying to say everything about the world. It's trying to say everything within certain limits to be complete within certain limits. I think that's important for the contemporary world which we live in. Um, so you're saying that the essay is or Adorno's point is that the essay is, is an inherently um, discursive and conversational, which comes back to this idea of it having it being very kind of distinct and discreet in its kind of boundedness, but at the same time very por um, permeable and porous, that it is always set within a broader discourse. I, I, I think it can be. I think it doesn't necessarily have to be. Okay can be i mean an, an essay can be as it can have a, a a totality in itself it doesn't have to be necessarily in discourse but it recognizes multiplicity okay. which doesn't necessarily mean um or dialogue should i say mm. so discourse yes but not necessarily dialogue um i guess what one reason why i would say it's of a sort of social political reason why it's really important at the moment is because of the <clears throat> well two reasons let's say two reasons first of all because of academia there's the intersectionality and there's the interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. and for anybody uh, working in the arts and humanities at the moment there are a broad range of um let's call them topics or issues for the moment that's debatable whether we can call them that topics or issues which everyone has to keep up with because we are changing our conception of the world in this new globalized world in this world of the internet in this world of change we are changing our conception of the world and how we live in it and so for example a certain topic you have to keep up with like racism sexism feminism um, the Anthropocene, uh, the, the um, decolonialism de and, and neocolonialism and so forth. Now, cl clearly these are a, a set of different, um, in a set of different uh, disciplines if you like, but there, there must be, everybody in every discipline must know about these things, must keep up to date with them. Now, it's, it would be impossible to read all the books in every single one of those fields. So the essay somehow uh, as a short form, you can keep up to date by so it's per, uh, by looking through essays. So so it's it's particularly uh, it's got a particular efficacy in this age, I would say, where we where we where uh, interdisciplinarity and intersectionality have come to the fore for various different uh, cultural, social, political reasons. That's um really interesting. I I. I'm kind of fascinated by the, the the premise to begin with, and I suppose it, it sort of it just shows how deeply set the essay is within the essay as a literary form is within our common psyche. That I didn't even really think of it as a distinct literary form, yeah. um, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of yeah I'm kind of fascinated by this idea. And and, and you point out in in the book that students. And the academic practice of, I mean, you've pointed out just now the academic paper is an essay, which I think is an interesting point and one I would like you to talk about a little bit more. But also we ask students to write essays yeah. without perhaps, and I certainly have never, talked about the essay as a distinct and discrete thing that is that, that that has its own characters uh, or own characteristics. Um, uh, so I'm kind of fascinated by this idea. 
um and and uh, as a consequence you know your your um opening salvos in the book in the introduction talking about montaigne and the various people that have fed off him i thought was um perhaps something that you could describe a little bit more because uh what i took from it um is that the essay has at its heart, you use the word dialogic, but it's a kind of skeptical, a skepticism that is built into it as a kind of, like it. it's always taking a critical approach. It's not, not critical. I don't know what the opposite of criti not critical, I've never been the opposite of critical in my life. I suppose, I suppose Raymond Williams might say it's bourgeois. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, no, I see what you mean. Okay, well, well, first of all, I'd say, look, okay, so we all know what the essay is. We mm -hmm. think we all do. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, everyone's written essays for as long as they can remember at school. The essay is used as a vehicle for, you know, for by, by students and by, um, uh, you know, teachers alike as a, a mode of exploration, a mode of investigation, but also always set as a mode of examination as a mode of examining students, but yet we never really, uh, so we accept it as such, we never really look into the history, why has that become the accepted form, more or less, mm. of the examination, of the understanding, of the exploration, why is that? Mm. Okay, uh, it's interesting, and, and I think part of that might be to do with the fact that the essay is a short form, right, so it has set limits, okay. Now, what I would propose in, in the book is that short form in general, I don't say this in the book, but I say it about the essay, short form in general, I would say uh, there's generally a, a prejudice against the short form in any kind of form. So we think about the short film as, you know, somehow less satisfying than the feature film. The short story is somehow less fulfilling than the novel. The essay is less comprehensive than the thesis. Uh, the, the sketch as less complete than the oil <laughs> painting, for example. So, there, but I would say there's not just a prejudice against the short form, but actually the short form is seen in Western history as, uh, and I do write about this in the uh, introduction, as heretical. Mm. In what sense is it heretical? That it, that it doesn't try to say the whole story. So uh, specifically, in the case of Montaigne, you're speaking about, and of Hume, whose uh, books, books of essays were both put on the, you know, the index uh, librorum prohibitorum, so the prohibited books by the church, they were declared heretical, right? What, so what does that mean? Well, as you say, there is some kind of inherent critical spirit, and is that to do with the notion of already saying, this, I'm only going to write this much. I'm not going to tell that whole thesis. I'm going to write about this. This is what I want to write about. So is there a kind of cynicism in, or a scepticism inherent in that? The scepticism that you can only know so much. There is only so much you can know about. Originally, Montaigne set out in his essays. He invented the term essay, by the way. And there's some dispute about what the term means. It could mean you know, an attempt to say yay, to attempt to try. So it's just an attempt. It's not, a, it's not the final thing. Uh, some other writers say it comes from the Latin essagiare, which means uh, to weigh up. So it's a weighing up of things. So Montaigne sets out at first to, to um, the idea of, so how can we know? What can we know? Que sais je? He says, I think that's his motto. What can we know? But he soon uh, kind of really gives up on that and says, we can't really know anything. We can't really know anything. Everything's just an attempt. Everything's just out there and nothing is complete. So, um, but what is interesting is this aspect of the essay as being her heretical. Because again, this depends on that idea of the limit and of the inside and the outside. Now, we'll come back to this, but I'm sure you can see that is immediately of interest to, for example, well, any, I, I think any arts and humanities score, but particularly architects, you're gonna start talking about uh, a border or an edge and what is inside and what is outside then that's very interesting and you always have a positionality because it's not completely essay you have a positionality so it's so the essay is always a vector 
if you like, it has its weight and it has its direction. Now, what I mean by that is that, so if you take the, the, the definition of the heretic and why, why they're being called heretical, not, not just by me, but by the philosopher Adorno calls the essay the heretical form. The Pope calls the essay the <laughs> heretical when, when the, or the Popes and various cardinals, when they ban the, the original book of essays by Montaigne and books of essays by Hume and others, okay? So, <clears throat> so what is actually is the heretic and what is the he heretical um, operation? That's interesting because that assumes an inside and an outside and a border as well. Because by definition, you know, the heretical as a, as a, as a, as a, a Christian uh, concept, you can't be an, a, a heretic unless you have been baptized. So in other words, the heretic is somebody who moves from inside, in this case being the church, but if, if you're talking Christian, but in general, move from inside to the outside, breaking through the border to the outside. Because when they're on the inside, they think something, I put it this way in the book, is awry. And by moving to the outside, they hope to set it alight. So there's all this question of inside, outside, and so forth. And that gets set up by the essay in particular because of the limit and, and, the, and the, the operation of the heretic. You can see how that would apply to that. Or a more up-to-date version that I also speak about, the hack, where the hack is someone who moves from the outside to the inside to uh, set something that may well be a right, but to set it awry. Mm. It's a kind of, so it's all about positionality, directionality, and vectors. Mm. Um, so that I think that's the operation that's been on in the essay, and that's why I think it's 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 really important, or it's really interesting for architects because there's that outside, there's that inside, there's the texture of outside, the texture of inside, there's mm. the movement from one to another, and there's a separation between the two. Now, architecture. As all, I was going to do this later, but anyway, architecture has always been, or, or certainly modern architecture has always been interested in that flow inside, outside. Mm. Siegfried Gideon speaks about it in the mid-20th century. And uh, I think it's become, as I say, it's become a, a, a pressing debate now because of the world we live in. Because, you know, basically we live in a world where more walls are currently being built to exclude people around this world than at any time ever before in history. We're talking about, of course, uh, you know, Trump's uh, USA Mexico wall. We're talking about the Palestine Israel wall. We're talking about the barriers being built on Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, you know, to exclude people. You've got even the uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, English Channel. Are being used as some sort of barriers, you know, they use some sort of moats really to keep people out. So you're setting up this outside and this inside and these barriers. And so in this uh, current world, there is an, uh, an urgency mm. for understanding what such borders and edges and limits mean and what the interior means, what's the, the texture of interior and exterior. Um, uh, and th these are urgent discourses we need to have. Yeah, for sure. Um, I like this idea of the the essay being a kind of heretical form, and I I don't know, but my 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 gut feeling would be that that this the essay as a sort of a, as an incomplete project, uh -huh. the essay as a porous kind of uh, literary form, uh -huh. flew in the face of the tradition of rhetoric of the kind of. So you 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 dis, uh, distinguished the thesis earlier. The the thesis being sort of the the complete thing, and the essay, you know, and the rhetorical form in which you kind of explore arguments and counter arguments. And you know, you, you, to go back to the church, you 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 bring in your devil's advocate against yourself. You try and prosecute yourself um, to make sure your your argument is robust and stands up to 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 analysis. Um, Whereas the essay doesn't do that, it has, and the essays that you select in the book are, I think, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, it's fair to say, but they are all characterized by a, 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 a yeah, 
a looseness and a kind of a, and an intention to be loose. So one encounters a lot of academic literature which uh, is loose because the uh, research is poor or the writer's not very good. Um, but I think in these this case that the, the work is, and you start with junk space, Coolhouse's junk space, mm -hmm. yeah. which is particularly loose, um, particularly un sort of curated, un incomplete as a project in 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 thesis and and in and in um, construction as well. And I really like this idea, so that we have this kind of this ideal form of literature, which is, as you say, the thesis, but the the the, the perfect rhetorical object. Um, and then we have the essay, which is kind of like the punk on the outside in a way. I hate using like metaphors like that, but or similes like that. But uh, it makes me feel very old, and uh, it's the kind of thing that a, ve a, ve a very uncool lecturer would say. But anyway, uh, it's kind of where I well, what I was thinking about it. But the the this idea of this skepticism seems mm -hmm. also to be about unpacking, and, and this is something you come back to again and again in your discourses around these key um, key essays, is about unpacking sort of hegemonic knowledge and knowledge structures, um, which are, as you said about the essay, it, characterized largely by uh, um, white European and male um, domination, um, essentially a colonialist domination. Um, and you and you use this, uh, I quote very um, briefly, the changes in the global condition which make this necessary. Yeah. And, I, and, and you've spoken about that already in terms of, for example, the construction of borders and the rise of this intersectionality or these, these dynamic um, subjects which require our which re require our fuller engagement but one of the other things that you point out is the use of and and this comes back to something that's kind of relevant to, to student learners um which is a tautology for which i apologize students um this idea of the passive voice and i wonder about this as well and i thought perhaps you could the way that we we ask students to write so on the one hand, we're giving them an, uh, a literary form which is about critique yeah. and about porosity and about breaking through borders and boundaries. And then we ask them to situate it in a voice that isn't theirs. And I kind of am a, a little confused about that. Um, and I wondered if you had any thoughts or had, had given that yeah, uh, I mean, I think you're right. I, I, I think that there is a massive, well, irony, if not contradiction, both probably one implies the other, maybe um, here because you know that's that's the strength of the as I think has already come out and the things have been seen already. That's one of the great strengths of the essay is that it is not something that's claiming to be total it's partial it's partial it's it's got this partiality as brian dillon says in his recent book essayism and uh, so that kind of uh, you know one way in which it, it has this partiality is in its subjectivism it's about the subject the subject trying to get to grips with this greater totality rather than the the objectivity of the final complete thesis it's 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 got this it's subjective nature mm. of posing something, of posing oneself in somewhere. So then, when we ask the students then to use that form, for, in which one of its greatest strengths are this subjectivism, but you say, but yet don't be subjective. So act as though this is the final objective statement. Mm but do it in the form uh, which is suited to the, the subjective uh, non-totality. Mm. So there's a real um, uh, well, I've, It's a difficulty, I've, isn't it? It is a difficulty. Difficult but but then, then again, you might say, well, okay, but you know, if you, you're asking a student, uh, you know, younger students to to understand these these conceptions of 
the subject and the object and completeness and partiality. It's already quite difficult in terms of its positionality and the vectors going on. Mm -hmm. um, um, but then, you know, also, you know, I, I think it's also Adorno that says, we'll, we'll look actually, you know, it, you sh it's wrong to think that everything should be broken down and start at the beginning. People should just get into something and be where it is. So, and I think that's one of the aspects that is present in this notion of the contemporary, mm. where, uh, you know, I don't think we can get down to some basics. There are no basics. So just accept this world and its complexity the way the way. Yeah. Well, I, I, I spoken with yeah the podcast episode i did with amica where we talked mm -hmm. about the use of the passive voice yeah and my my gut feeling and i, I think amica was in agreement to some degree was that we use the passive voice to add a kind of in the humanities particularly the arts and humanities particularly we use it to add the kind of luster of scientific rigor of, yeah. of the dispassionate observer kind of exploring um, the phenomenon in front of us without any kind of impact. Um, and that's actually untrue because yeah. the subjectivity, it's, science, is it? yeah. it's not science, it's the social science. And actually what we do is we, we embrace our effect on the things that we encounter and then we, we kind of toler build tolerances in to make to, to account for them with it within our analysis. Um, but that kind of comes on to this second thing that I was really keen on sort of having you unpack a bit around the idea of performativity, which is a word that crops up in the book. Um, and it crops up a lot in social sciences discourse and sociology and and increasingly in certain forms of architectural discourse as well. Um, this idea of the effects of, um, the, um, of the observer, the role of language specifically in being effective in the world. And I, and I thought that maybe you could, well, I had hoped that you maybe could sort of unpack the idea of performativity, particularly as it relates to architectural production and architectural um, artifacts. Uh, a bit for us. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the interesting points about the relationship, first of all, just to say one thing about the relationship between the, the literary form and architecture, is that, um, you know, there's quite a tradition of, uh, I'm going to switch my phone off, there's quite a tradition of um, a literary architectural model being used to um, to perform, if you like, certain social relations mm -hmm. and show to, to display rather, I suppose, certain social relations. So we're talking about things like the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to use an architectural model to understand the, the, the production of different languages. We're talking about the um, Panopticon, you know, obviously, originally Bentham, but then used by Foucault. Uh, to understand the disciplinary society, right? And we're talking about the, uh, and these are largely you know, literary models, you know, not going on, a, 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 an absolute panopticon probably never existed, never ever. Anyway, and the, uh, of course, now the, the junk space by uh, Rem Coulthard. And the point about this junk space is that uh, he performs the junk space in that article by showing that the, the article just breaks in to a beginning and breaks out from a beginning. There's no real beginning and end. It's like a kind of excerpt. So actually you can see that it could go on forever in both directions. So it could be totally endless. And he performs that with, with the uh, literary form he uses by breaking into a beginning with a, 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 an aphorism at the beginning, an aphorism at the end. And, um, the way he describes it, describes these interiors, so he's talking about this endless interiors, these endless interiors. So again, there's this inside and outside, but he's saying there's no outside. 
But we see that the inside that he described, all the metaphors that he uses to describe it, or all the similes that he makes, all the, certainly all the figures, are standards of uh, Western society. So he compares it to you know, Dante, biblical figures, Greek mythological figures. It's all standard Western uh, um, literary figures. So, so in other words, this eternal inside that is being built is keeping you know, the rest of the world outside. And he performs this via the use of language here. So uh, that's, that's really interesting, I find, as a, as a, as a way to, to start to make this idea of inside and outside and the texture of it and who gets allowed inside and who doesn't get allowed inside. Mm. So that, that is one way where you can immediately understand the performance of that, uh, <clears throat> that way of being. Um, in terms of the, what is interesting is in terms of the, uh, you see, the, the, the way that our, um, our uh, actions or the way of our approach to something um, uh, conditions how we understand it and it conditions us in our understanding of it too. Um, I think it's something that goes back to uh, probably quantum, 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 quantum physics uh, uh, and back to you know Einstein, beginning of the century, Niels Bohr and so forth, where there's the idea that uh, the the basic particle uh, is it even a particle? The basic unit, the basic form of of material can be sometimes a particle and sometimes a, a waveform. And it depends on the way you approach it and the way you try to measure it and the way you act with it. And so that, so that uh, um, the way we uh, interact with the world, or as Barad puts it, interact, uh, it, it both changes us and it changes them. We are what we interact with. Mm. So um, <clears throat> this is quite interesting because um, Back in the 1920s, when there was this this new physics was coming out, um, Cornford, uh, F. M. Cornford, the great classical scholar, he wrote about it. He said, "Look, uh, the actual the Greek space, you know, the Euclidean space, was something really new for the Greeks, and and they didn't understand it at first. And it took them hundreds of years for that to become an accepted, commonsensical form of space, the way we accept that now for us." That Euclidean space is commonsensical, and the new understandings of space that, that have come through um, relativity and quantum mechanics and so forth still aren't a common sense. For us. They're still somehow a wee bit absurd and illogical. But gradually, Confort says, what's going to happen is gradually we will become, we will adopt that as our common sense, a new way of understanding space. And I think that's what's happening here. Uh, already with Barad, for example, in her new understanding of how phenomena work, the interaction that um, that there is no me that then acts with the things around the world. What I am is a whole series of interactions with things, and I am changed and changed with my interactions with them, and and I change them, and so it's about a uh, um, yeah. Uh, and interrelationships going on, intra interaction is the only way you can see it because it's ongoing. So, yeah. So, and I think that's all tied up with this notion of performity, performativity as well, that we are performing who we are. There's not an I am somebody, and then I go into my engagements with the world around me as that somebody. I am who I am, if you, if you want to use the verb to be, because of my engagements. And my interactions with the world that's what makes me i think this is really beautiful and it's been it's been something i've been struggling to get my head around i was talking to a phd student yesterday a woman called rishi mahanti who's who's looking at the, the digital and the way that the digital she's a she's a ux designer and uh, by trade and she's looking at the way that the digital interfaces that we carry around in our pockets now transforms our uh, engagement with but also our appreciation of the urban environment and therefore Im impacts the way that the urban environment actually is constructed and i think it's a it's um 
it's a very, very complicated topic because what it points to is this idea, perhaps, of virtuality, which, which Catherine Hales writes brilliantly about as well. Um, that perhaps actually what the internet represents, this is, is the emergence of a space that is fundamentally relativistic in, mm -hmm. in the kind of physics sense of that, in that you are a series, you are converted to a series of interrelational moments rather than a, a, a totemic kind of absolute entity, which is kind of fascinating, kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, go on. But you, you also asked about the, the, the you, you'd asked me about the postmodern. Yeah. Uh, and if the contemporary, where I, I refer to the contemporary, the contemporaries in the title. Um, <clears throat> and um, you asked me if, oh, is contemporary just another name for the postmodern or what mm. the difference there? I guess what I would say is that the contemporary, and you said is the contemporary some new epoch like modernism or something like that. Well, mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's not, an epoch. It's, I suppose what I would say would be to think of, or I think of, or we can think of the contemporary that we're in now as being an attitude, mm. right? So where obviously there's been a whole load of changes uh, from the period when postmodernism, let's say from the 80s onwards, right, uh, takes place. And where postmodernism, if you like, is, um, is a reaction to the over rationality of the enlightenment a kind of ironic stance to a rejection of a rejection of the meta narrative it's it's what is it, the culture of late capitalism you know and so various Lyotard and uh, Jimison and so forth um but of course it's specifically that reaction to that western enlightenment so postmodernity, as some African critics have said means nothing to them because they never had that over rationality in the first place of the enlightenment so, so why should postmodernism? Why should they take an ironic stance to 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 the rationality of modernism and of the modernism that comes out in line? It was never anything to do with their culture anyway. So, so it's a real European thing, uh, or, you know, an American thing, obviously, European cultural thing. So, um, and now that we live in this world that that is glo glo truly globalized, I mean, since WTO in what nineteen ninety four or whatever. And, and that we have the internet and that we are on social media all day, every day, as you say, creating these new relations. We live in a very different world. So, but when I say it's an attitude, what, what, what it does is it creates new, it's a new attitude to time, which means that there's all sorts of different times side by side, rather than just thinking of, of, of time as being one long arrow, Mm -hmm. of here's, here's western history going on as one long you know vector going one direction then there's lots of different times happening and changing at the same time for temporality mm -hmm. but what do we mean by that well for example uh you know we're so we're on the internet dealing with different things diff so is there a space there is there a time there it's it's at different times the internet from a book or from the way we're sitting here for example so there's that going on but not just that if you take some examples of things like uh, say the museum for example boris Grosch points this out the museum for example so I should say, right, so, okay, since Fukuyama and, you know, the, the 1990 cut-off date with the, with the um, you know, the Iron Curtain, we no longer have some kind of economic, political, future alternative. So, so there's no more history in, the term, in terms that there's no more um, choice of economic and political systems, this, you know, and that, um, as uh, I think it's Jameson that says that we can, it's easier to foresee the end of the world than it is to see the end of capitalism. So there's capitalism just here forever now, according to that kind of way of looking at things. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's, there's no uh, arrow into the future as we had with uh, modernism of thinking, right, that let's prepare all this like Corbusier, let's prepare this new future. That's, that's not the thought, I mean, it's all about the present now in terms of social media and interaction and the internet. Mm. Not only that, but if you think about the museum, as I was going to say, the museums, uh, there's a kind of change here towards the centre of contemporary art, 
which is a much more um, participatory type place. It's much more horizontal. You don't just go there just to, to pay homage to the standards of the culture. You go there to engage, to get involved in groups, to make things in an open source, to, do, to, to bring your own exhibition to it, to bring your own engagement to it. So that's a different thing. Okay, but not only that, but in uh, the, the typical museums now, you don't so much go just to see the standard um, uh, permanent exhibitions. There are always temporary exhibitions going on. And at these temporary exhibitions, what happens? Of course, we reevaluate history. So history is changing every day before our very eyes. There's not one set of history that we've left behind and we're moving to one future. The future we're not thinking about anymore. We're in the present, completely in the present, with lots of different uh, times going on in terms of the internet, social media, uh, reading a book with our, our fellows in, in, in IRL and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, but not only that, we're also changing history all the time. So there are lots of different temporalities and understandings of, of time going on at the same time. And so, again, the essay is something that I think is particularly effective in um, investigating, analysing and, and exposing this condition. Mm. Now, to, yeah. Because there's this multiplicity rather than one big thesis which says it all Plato, there you have it, the Republic, that's the beginning and the end of everything, right? There are many, uh, and the totality, its totality, is not total. So mm. it has to be self-standing and on its own and set within specific uh, limits, but yet it's not claiming that to be everything. Mm. So That's really <laughs> That's a really interesting idea, and it and it points to this idea of the. There's a paper that I teach on which talks. No, it's a book actually, a very good book by a woman called Sharon Macdonald called Memory Lands, which talks about the the emergence of memory over history, of the subjective over the objective, mm -hmm. um, and the way that in 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 terms of say for example built history, built architectural history, we're starting to see the emergence of the, 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 the rapid growth of these museum spaces, which do as you say, they, they, um, they have their permanent bits and pieces, and then they have their, their traveling players that, that sail around the world. And it's a quite, very interesting thing. But you also have, in, in contrapoint to that, you have the things like Eisenman's um, Holocaust Mem Memorial, yeah. which is a is a totally undidactic space in a certain sense, in that it doesn't actually present you with any of the artifacts or uh, material of the event, but simply provides you with a framework in which to contemplate personally, subjectively, about the horror. Yeah, and, it, and it's it kind of genius certain, as a consequence. Yeah, it, it demands certain orientations of the body. There's that thing of the vector there as well, isn't it? Mm. There's direction and there's movement. Mm. Yeah, so it demands and, 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 and then a pondering upon that. Yeah, yeah. And Eisenman, I mean, Eisenman, you mentioned Derrida obviously beforehand, and you also mentioned in Junk Space the idea of the text, the essay text as um, sort of um, uh, performing that which it is discussing. And Derrida and Eisenman's text did likewise, didn't it? Where the book had literally got holes in it. Um, yeah. One of the more um, sort of fist-bitingly embarrassing moments in literary history, I imagine. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll leave that aside. Um, but but th there is this, this quote of Barrett's in the, that you make, which is, we know because we are of the world. So we don't know by standing aside and looking at it. We know because we are of the world. And this kind of come, coming back to this idea of the subjective memory over history. Mm -hmm this idea of the ordinary, ordinary and the everyday nature of our experience. I think a lot of your essays, often using extremely complicated language, and you do, you do pick out, um, uh, I think it is Barrett again, isn't it? The way that she uses language yeah. in a yeah, Joycean fashion, essentially. Yeah. Perhaps that's how they thought of Shakespeare when he was writing all his made up words as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of like, wondered whether you could if you had anything to kind of observe or say about this idea of, of the ordinary and the everyday. 
Well, in, you know what? Go on. Yeah, I, I think you kind of touched on it there with the Eisenman thing, which I think is a really good metaphor to come back to that there, because, because as you say, there's no explicit um, uh, reference to the horror there. There's no explicit reference to the history there. There are just for, there's a repetition of forms and a variation on heights and dimensions of a certain size. They're not exactly anthropomorphic, they're slightly bigger than that, slightly heavier than that, that they could be oppressive. There's a series of, of, of uh, you know, pathways between these blocks that are slightly bigger than anthropomorphic. That uh, and therefore it could be slightly oppressive in 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 the um, sort of repetitive variation on a heavy block theme, slightly larger than than anthropomorphic. Therefore, making a reference to anthropomorphic, but mm -hmm. not be anthropomorphic. Uh, there's these paths that crisscross through between these blocks. I'm, I'm doing all this from memory, of course. Uh, these paths that crisscross between these blocks, and 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 we understand these as paths, and we understand that it's somehow a, a reference to being lost, but also being able to orientate yourself, and in between these oppressive blocks are also something maybe to do with 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 the city and therefore the civic. And therefore, civilization and civilization will oppress, will ultimately oppress. So, you know, and how do we know all these things? We just know all these things through dimension, direction, and movement. There is no words involved. Mm. And so I think that is is the is the illustration par excellence. Mm of that very phrase you've picked out, we know because we are of the world. Mm. And we know, so uh, although there's no explicit history there, there still is history and there's mm. humanity and there's forms and our engagement with forms and what forms mean to us and, and the whole history of, of humanities. This is really, really good because you, you've mentioned forms. You critiqued Plato and his... <clears throat> Yeah. And then you mention forms, and I'm, I'm not. We, we can't go down there because this is too big. But, but yeah, I, yeah, but yeah. I, but I think, but I think fundamentally. I mean, the Eisenman thing is a great example because it's also, as you said, you picked up on it's the, um, it's the deconstructing of certain hegemonic ideas. So it it essentially looks like a modernist city. It looks like yeah. a classical yeah. city. It looks like um, all of these things, which are then implicated yeah in the show and that's i think um i mean he's a he's a very he's a very great architect in this respect in that yeah. it's it, it's sort of like you know w walking into a piece of Benini architecture i mean sure. you, you kind of get what he's saying even without it being said and and you know ultimately quality architecture my wife my wife uses this phrase when she she likes novels that show but don't tell Didactic mm -hmm. novels are very boring. Yes, yes, indeed. You want the character's action to explain their motivation. And likewise, great architecture, I think, falls into this category where it and and, and Rem Coolhaus likewise is very good at this. Yes. Where there is an implication of the motivation of the architect and the objective of the building and the critical stance in relation to the built environment, which is just there. You don't need signage. The building is the sign, in a way. I mean, a heretical thing to say, but here I'm going to say it heretical. After speaking about heresy and what heresy is, breaking breaking out from my book, I would say that you know, yeah, the Rem Koolhaas thing is yeah, he absolutely, and, and I think these are the two great architectural examples. There are two arch, among the chosen essays in this book. I have two written by architects. Yeah, one by Rem Koolhaas and one by A. L. Weizmann, and then. Um, so Rem has, yeah, and he starts, he's used right at the beginning, as you see, because of that kind of notion like you're saying, we are of the world, then we know the world, we understand the world. And the um <clears throat> I think a lot of the 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 
sort of actual writing and I see some of it is 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 uh, I don't know if I'm going to say the word poor, but some of it is I don't think it's very good. But the overall conception of it, the overall thrust, you know, maybe thrust is a better word than conception, the overall thrust of it, I think, is really important because it does perform that making an inside. Mm. It makes an inside. And it makes us think what is inside and what is outside. And like I say, that's one of the great strengths of the essay. That's what mm. the essay does. And that's why it's really important. And that's why it's important an architect that writes this uh, because it's a, it's a, a, a it's something that obviously you can't be involved in, in architecture without having a consideration of what that means, what is inside, what is outside, who's inside, who's outside, what constitutes inside, outside, and what comes between them, and and how is the the movement, if movement is necessary between these two, how how is it to be performed under what conditions? I think the other thing that the, the essay does that is really important for us. Or might be really important for architects from what this book I, I would hope brings out is brought out in the AL Weizmann piece because you know Weizmann, of course, being head of the uh, forensic architecture unit at um, Goldsmiths, is really interesting because that unit what it does is it engages in in or ca cases of of perhaps corruption or or where, where uh, there has been uh, some social injustice done and it seeks to expose the injustice or the corruption and, and to show that in some kind of open forum. Mm -hmm. Okay, this immediately doesn't sound like architecture, of course. And uh, you start to think, in, in what way is this architecture? And that's what makes it really interesting. Um, I mean, you can read all of the... Uh, A.L. Weitzman's books about this, but anyway, uh, what makes this architecture? Uh, significant here, of course, is, is, is the adjective forensic, which nearly, which is generally being used in the wrong way. I, is, that, is that possible? If a word is generally being used in the wrong way, is that in fact not its new way? But anyway, forensic relates to the law. People think it relates to science. No, it doesn't. It means to do with the law. So it's about legal architecture. Well, what does that mean? Anyway, what, 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 what they do in their uh, projects is, so they'll take on something where let's say some, let's say there's been a bombing in Syria by the Russians. The Russians have denied, or, or it may well have been, there's been a bombing in Syria. The Russians deny it was them. Mm -hmm. what, what they do is they collect loads of testimonials, evidences, statements, you know, residua, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they construct an event. So they'll look at where the clouds were at that day to to know what time of day it was, and they'll be able to see. And people will provide them with photographs of an aeroplane coming in or a bomb coming down, and they will be able to fix these uh, different pieces of disparate evidence supplied by different subjects subjective people uh, together by looking at with the clouds show that there may be somebody in Russia will say, oh, well, these planes took off at four o'clock here. So if the bombing took place at, at eight o'clock in Syria, that would be, you know, that would seem to conform to, to this narrative. So, so they reconstruct a series of events by looking at them in space and by taking lots of different evidences. Okay, so that's architecture as an event, if you like. And that's not anything new. That's been around since the eighties with people like Chumi and uh, uh, and Eisenman and um, you know um, Daniel Lubeskin and things like that. Okay, so that's nothing new. But what what is interesting is that um, <clears throat> right. So they construct that using lots of different subjective evidences and putting it together. It can sometimes be a built model. It can be a series of photographs or testaments and things. There's lots of different ways they use this evidence to construct this happening in space. Now, if you look at the traditional forms of um, uh, architectural drawing, of architectural models, if you like, the, the, the drawing as a model of, of a building that's going to be, for example, a, a design drawing, then that was set more or less, if you like, uh, uh, in some sort of official manner by uh, Raphael in the 16th, Raphael, the, the painter and architect, 
artist and architect in the 16th century in a letter to the Pope. That's a kind of standard source of where you find it. And he says to says to the Pope, he says, look, the plan, the uh, elevation and the section are the standard drawings of architecture. And why is that? Because, because of the instructional element in these, because these are not subjective in any way. They aim at a total objectivity, right? And remember what we've been, bearing in mind what we've been saying about the difference between the subjective and the objective uh, in terms of uh, the essay as opposed to the thesis or, you know, the short film as opposed to feature, all that stuff, right? Okay, so <clears throat> bearing that in mind, these three drawings are totally objective. You know, when you look at a plan of a building, a design plan made. That's not anybody's view of it. Nobody can ever see that. Or, or okay, even if that's hidden below a roof or whatever. Even if you look at an elevation, that's not anybody's view. It's not a subjective view. That would be a perspective. There's no perspective in these architecture books because they're instructional. They're measured, and you're supposed to be able to build accurately from them. So the the aim is to be, or they claim to be, totally objective. Now, if you look at what um uh. Uh, Weizmann and forensic architecture are doing in um, constructing these models. They're actually taking lots of subjective testimonies. They're not making any claim to it being objective, although there is a tendency to objectivity through, because he says the more, he talks about poly, poly perspectival, and the more perspectives we have, the, the gradually it becomes more and more, this tendency towards objectivity becomes greater. But, it's, but there's no final objectivity. There's just lots of subjective viewpoints put together. So there again, you see that's the, this uh, dichotomy of the subjective and the objective that is really important in terms of the essay and in terms of uh, understanding some new way of looking at things, some different ways of looking at things. And, and, and that's really exposed, I think, in the, in the um, A.L. Weizmann case because of that yeah. what a lovely point to finish on johnny that's a really fantastic um unpacking i think of some of the only some touching scraping the surface of your excellent book um thank you very much thanks a lot really thanks, enjoyed it. Cheers. cheers well wasn't that fun thanks to johnny for being such an engaged and thoughtful guest please follow the links in the podcast description to the book which you should buy and to johnny's various online presences and of course please like subscribe follow and share airs for architecture with every living soul in the whole wide world and thanks for listening once more cheers